Welcome to this podcast brought to you by the Vatican Observatory Foundation. I'm your host, Bob Chembley. I'm an internet factotum for the Vatican Observatory Foundation, the first vice president of the Warren Astronomical Society in Michigan, and a volunteer NASA JPL solar system ambassador. Sacred Space Astronomy is the Vatican Observatory's online community. We have several astronomers and scholars who write articles on our website about astronomy, space science, and faith in science. Every full moon, the Vatican Observatory Foundation hosts a Zoom meetup for our Sacred Space Astronomy subscribers. Typically, our guest will be a member of the Vatican Observatory staff or an affiliated researcher, and they will tell us about the research they are doing and the journey that led them to the Vatican Observatory. Brother Guy Consolmagno, director of the Vatican Observatory and president of the Vatican Observatory Foundation, will talk with our guest and our Sacred Space Astronomy subscribers can ask questions. This podcast was taken from the Full Moon Zoom Meetup on July 24th, 2021. Our guest was Dr. Gabriella Navarro, who successfully defended her PhD thesis in Rome on November 30th, four months later. Dr. Navarro is a native of Chile and has attended universities in both Santiago and Rome. She studies the Milky Way's structure, formation, and evolution. She will continue her research as a postdoc in Rome, working with the James Webb Space Telescope. Gabriela Navarro is a finishing graduate student in um, astrophysics and an alumna of the 2018 Vatican Observatory Summer School and one of the organizers of the 2019 Vatican Observatory Super Summer School. So first, Gabriela, tell us a little bit about where you're from. So... First of all, thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to meet all of you, like virtually speaking, but it's it's really, really nice to see all of you. So I am from Chile, but not from Santiago de Chile. I'm from the south, almost Patagonia. is a small city called Valdivia. That ah. is almost, you know, <laughs> it's almost 1,000 kilometers to the south of Santiago. So it's pretty cold. It's super rainy. Like when I was there, it was raining 300 days a year. So it's a very rainy city, but it's very beautiful with this river in the middle and and it's nice. So I'm I'm from there originally. So what did your parents do? So both are engineers. So both are working in companies and doing math and this kind of thing. And actually they wanted me to do the same. So I had to fight for being an astronomer. Well, I'm still fighting for that, but not with my parents anymore. Yes. Okay. What got you interested in astronomy? If it's rainy and cloudy all the time, how can you even see that there's a sky? Yeah, that's true. Well, in Chile, of course, you know that the, the sky is beautiful, it's, it's, it's very clear. And actually, even in the south, when it's not cloudy, the stars are amazing because we it's a small city in the middle of in nowhere, so we can see very clearly the sky. So next to my window, there was like the, a roof, so I was going constantly there. And I started looking at the sky when I was like around 10, maybe, or 11. And I just fall in love with that. And and from that moment, I really wanted to do something related to that. Of course, the first thing was trying to become an astronaut. So this was the first uh, goal that I I had. And actually, this is the goal that I still have that can be a dream or a goal or whatever. So um, when you studied in high school, did you, uh, were, did they split you into sciences and arts or were you able to sort of study a little bit of everything? Yeah, we, we were doing everything kind of together, but the last four years we can decide which is your field, let's say. And it was funny because I was the only girl trying to do physics. So they were calling me Gabriel for <laughs> some time. And, and we were just like 10 or 15 that really liked math and physics. So I was part of this group and I really, really like it. So from the very beginning, I, I was very involved on that. And I took some courses from the university when I was in high school. Uh, to 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 study, for example, programming and, and these kind of things. But they're, then they were very useful in the university, in fact. So where did you go to university? What was your undergraduate? 
So I went to the Catholic University in Chile. So I had to move from Valdivia to Santiago, that is the capital, mm -hmm. because uh, in, in Valdivia, it doesn't exist. So I really like to practice sports. So this is funny because I wanted to be a sport teacher or an astronomer. <laughs> so it was super different. And actually I, I applied to both in the, when I had to apply to the university. University. The first option was astronomy, and if they didn't accept me, I would be like a, t a sport uh, teacher. And my what's, parents what's, were crazy for that, but I just took the risk. <laughs> what is your sport? What's your favorite sport? So I was I was doing a track and field and volleyball, and actually I am still doing. I'm I'm really used to the practice sports. So in the school, I was going at 6 a.m. to practice sports before the school. And now I'm preparing for the marathon, for example. So it's something that is always with me because it, I don't know, it helped me uh, for stress release and everything else that I think we all have. So practicing sports is something very important in, in my life. Mm -hmm. And then for graduate work, where did you decide to go? So then for graduate, I met Dante, uh, that probably most of you know, Dante Miniti. So he was my co-supervisor in the bachelor. And I, uh, I decided to continue working with him. And he invited me to uh, UNAP, Universidad Andres Bello in Chile. But I wanted to also study abroad. So we started searching for different options and I found the Sapienza University of Rome that is really good for my project because they do the theoretical part of my project. So I decided to do this double PhD. So I entered to both university and I'm doing some time in Chile and some time in Italy. So at what point in all these studies did you hear about the Vatican Observatory summer schools? So I remember that the first time was maybe the first year of PhD or even the last year of bachelor that Dante told me about his experience here. And he was like, this is the best summer school I had in my life. I was like, wow, this is the fact that uh, Dante was involved in this uh, you know, group from a long time and he's really attached with the, with the Vatican Observatory. So, uh, that's why I was really, really excited to, to apply to the summer school. And at some point, uh, when I got the opportunity to apply, I, I was like very convinced that I wanted to, to go there. Well, I've been on the uh, other side of, you know, deciding who gets to come and who doesn't. But I'd love to hear a little more of your experience applying. How long did you have to wait? How did you feel when you heard you got in? What were the things you were expecting? How did it turn out? Just tell us a little more about the experience of being a student. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because Dante, of course, he didn't want to help me uh, because it will, you know, bias a bit the, the application. So he left me by myself. And I really didn't know what to do because when this is maybe just I think in this way, but when you put science and religion, it's really difficult to know how to, I don't know, a, a pro, a to talk about both things together or to convince someone that you are a, a, a good option for this summer school. So it was really difficult in that sense because I really didn't know what you were searching for. Uh, so the application procedure was, was tricky in that sense. So I just took the risk and I, I don't remember, but <laughs> I try to do my application the best I can. And also the fact that, of course, the topic was really, really important for me. And indeed, uh, it like improved my thesis. Like this is incredible because it's not that I learned an old experience that I had, but in fact, the topic was really, really uh, like perfect for me. So the application process was a bit, was more difficult than the other summer schools that I applied for just because it was more unknown the the like uh, everything the, the field or or the I don't know the the summer school itself uh, but also just because of this was more interesting so I, I was really wanted to 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 go there and then we waited for a couple of months I think maybe 
And then when I got the, the mail, I was super happy. And I went to Dante's office in the, in the university, like, Dante, I made it. And Dante was super happy as well. And then I started texting other friends that I applied and some got ex the, the acceptance and some others didn't make it. So it was really, really nice. I, I remember perfectly that day that I went to Dante's office. Probably I was too happy, <laughs> but he, he shared the fitting at some point. I, I, we know the rule, only rule we have limiting people is no more than two from any country. Yeah. And it's really hard on the students from Argentina and Chile because yeah. historically we've had so many good students from there. And uh, there was, I, you probably know about this from your work with the super school. There was one year where twins applied. Oh no. <laughs> and we could only, we only accepted one, but the other one got in the next school two years later. So it all worked out. Okay, okay. <laughs> that's really sad. Yeah. So, okay, you, you finally uh, were accepted and then you, uh, of course, had to make your arrangements to fly here. And yes. so in, in June of 2018, you mm -hmm. show up at the Rome airport. Had you already had a connection with Rome by then? Were you already in Rome? How did that work? Yeah, the, this is the crazy part of the story that I was moving to Rome, to live in Rome, to start the second part of my PhD, the same moment that I was coming to the uh, to the to the summer school. So I was coming to the summer school and I would stay in Rome forever. And I'm still here. So <laughs> it was pretty crazy because I was moving out from Chile forever. And the first place that I came in Italy was the Vatican Observatory. So it was really, really nice because the shock was different than coming to live in another country for the first time. The first, very first moments were the Vatican summer school. So that's why also, for me, it was like finishing one stage and starting another. And in the middle, this summer school was amazing. So who did you wind up rooming with? Uh, in the room? Yeah, in, in, while you were at the summer school, you we usually put you know, like two people to a, a... Yes, I was with Hasmik, a girl from Armenia, and Rojita from uh, Nepal. So it was super nice. The, uh, we call each other sisters because we were sleeping together for one month. So, and we still talk a lot. So it's really nice the fact that, I mean, I don't know why this summer school is, is different than the others because I have been to, to some summer schools during my PhD, but this one, like the, the group that we have is, is stronger for some reason. So we, we keep talking to each other along. It's, it's super nice. And of course, uh, I know Navik was the one who uh, had climbed Mount Everest, right? Yeah, yeah. Actually, it's funny because Rajita is the girl from Nepal that was in my room as well. So the first days, Rajita was sleeping a lot. I was like, why do you come to this summer school and you sleep? But of course, she was tired because she came from the Everest, basically. So she was like just recovering after this whole month in the mountain. So it was really nice to, to share with them also because... I think we learn a lot about different cultures. And I think this is very, very important in life also. When you when you live abroad, you, you learn, but in this summer school, you learn way more because we were from very different countries and backgrounds. So I think it's very interesting that part as well. So I'm going to switch now into the stuff that's really interesting, which is the astronomy. Mm -hmm. Because yes. we're all here because we're interested in astronomy. Uh, give us the short version of what your thesis is, you know, what you would tell your friends back home, and then we'll start digging into the deeper science. Okay, so, so basically my thesis is about studying galactic structure, formation and evolution, studying variability in the galactic belt. And I'm doing this uh, in using both, uh, two different indicators. So I'm using microlensing events and I'm using our LIDAR stars, but, uh, but always with the same uh, uh, goal, let's say, that this is studying the structure and the evolution and the, and the formation of the, of the Milky Way. This is more or idea. So you're working specifically on the Milky Way? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dante has a big program involving the Milky Way. Can you tell us a little bit about that? 
Yeah, so Dante is the PI of the VVV survey that is a survey with the, that is using the VISTA telescope that is a four meter telescope located in Cerro Paranal that is scanning the Milky Way, uh, the bulge and one part of the disk in the infrared. So this is really nice because we can go through the dust and we can detect stars and we can do variability also there because we are scanning already for 10 years with this survey. So it's really unique. I think the data set that the VVV is giving now because it's the first uh, big survey in the infrared that is scanning the galactic center. And in the galactic center, we don't know many things. There are many, many surveys doing variability in other places in the, in the galaxy. And they are pretty complete and the cadence is really high and everything. But in the galactic center where the dust is, I think the infrared is the only way to do it. So I think, uh, I mean, this survey is very important also to plan the campaign for the next surveys that are coming, the James Webb, the, w, the not the that we first, the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope and, and many others that are going to discover uh, a lot of stars and variability in, the, in that area, that is the dusty area. So remind us what VVV stands for. So variable vistas in the Via Lactea. So this is the, the um, the, the, the reason why it has this name. Okay, and what is the big overwhelming question that you're trying to solve? So if the, the formation of the galaxy, I would say, because this is a scope of the VVV in general, the 3D map of the galaxy. So, so this is something that we still don't know very well. And I think with this survey, and others we, we will be able to understand better for sure. And explain why you can see things better in the infrared if there's dust and clouds. So yeah, so actually the point is that we can go, depending on the wavelength, we can study different things. And the, the, depending also in the size of the, of the object or, or, the, or of the, um, let's say the, the, not the environment, but the, uh, yeah, let's say the, the environment, we can go through different studies. And for example, when we want to study the dusty areas or the resonant areas, the, it's like to put a wall in front of any survey that is scanning in the optical. So it's the same thing that happened when we observe something and we cannot observe through a wall. And with the infrared, we can go through it because the wavelength is smaller. So we are studying, for example, in this case, 2.2 microns. And with this, it's possible to go through this dust and, and, and observe the, what is in the other side of this wall. But what's the typical size of the dust that you're avoiding? Well, this, I don't know. I should know, but I don't know the number. It's because yeah. basically the dust, if the dust is smaller than the wavelength, then the dust doesn't affect the wavelength. Yes. Much. Uh -huh. Yeah, but I, I don't know exactly the number. And this is a good question that can appear in my thesis defense. <laughs> well, okay. will this, is, this is a test for your oral exam then. <laughs> yes, thank you for that. Yes. Okay, so you said you're measuring variables. What do variables tell you? So in this case, I'm studying Aralida stars. I'm, I really like Aralida stars. They are, these are pulsating stars that pulsate with uh, periods from one, uh, around one day. And these uh, stars are very important because they are in the horizontal branch, but in the instability strip. So they are pretty old, let, let's say 10 giga years, and they are metal core. Why? it's important to study these stars because they are old. So we can study the first stages of the, of the galaxy. So we can study the past. And also because they are distance indicators because they are standard candles. So if we measure the uh, brightness of these RLR stars, we can measure the distance. So we can study the 3D distribution of them. So this is very interesting. So they're, but they're stars that, <clears throat> You presume date back to the beginning of the galaxy, mm -hmm. and yes. then you can measure out their, their their abundance and see to sort of figure out what the original structure of the galaxy. It's kind of like looking at a roadmap from a yeah. hundred years ago to try to figure out how the city has changed. 
Exactly. And this is what I'm doing actually now is using simulations, embody simulations, that this is a theoretical part of my thesis. So we are simulating the formation of the galaxy and using these embody simulations to compare with, the, with what we observe now. So in the simulation, I'm trying to detect these uh, RLR candidates and compare them with the distribution of RLRs that we observe now. And this is a mess because we, with the dust and everything, we are pretty complete with the RLR catalogs in the center. So we are not even sure about the observations. And then, of course, the models, they have some, some errors that are coming from these uh, approximations and everything. But the, the main idea is that like I'm using uh, simulations to reproduce what we are observing now. So as I recall, it was people looking at the infrared at the center of the galaxy who are actually able to see stars orbiting around the black hole at the center. Yeah, actually, uh, this is something that is really, really interesting because even in these embodied simulations, we see some very interesting behaviors of these stars that are passing near this supermassive black hole. So yeah, it's, it's more or less the same, but in this case, we are studying a little bit farther from the, uh, from the black hole because we, we are not able still to detect these stars. So in the future, probably with these space telescopes that are coming now and they are scanning the center of the galaxy in the infrared, we will be able to detect these stars and, and complete this catalog. But for now, we are a bit outer from this, this area. Where do you hope to go? You're pretty close to graduating at this point, right? When are you going to defend? Yeah, actually, uh, on November, more or less. I'm, I'm almost done with the thesis, and, and I think it's fine. I'm not suffering that much because uh, we, we got some really nice results that are already published, so I think it's going well. And then what happens? Then what will you do? This is a really, really good question. So after this, the postdoc, and I'm uh, actually, I started applying for postdocs just to see how is the procedure, because I still have some months to finish the thesis. And, and I'm, now I'm searching for postdocs uh, everywhere, basically. And, and I'm in this situation. So I know that I want to continue with research because I really like it. Because in this moment, I have a lot of friends that decided not to continue in academia also because searching for postdocs is pretty competitive. And at some point we get all frustrated with the rejections, but I think this is part of it. So I know that I want to continue yeah, in academia now. The, the super Voss that we held here in uh, 2019 that you helped organize had as its theme, the search for extra astronomical life. Yes. <laughs> and the, the joke behind it was, what was do you afraid. do after you leave astronomy? Yes. Yeah, actually this is something that I was thinking a lot because I really like outreach and science communication and I'm doing many things related to this. For example, I, I tell you that two, two or three weeks ago, we won some money from the Italian government to teach astronomy in schools in, this, in the region around Rome. And this is nice because we were the only uh, project that were uh, proposed by people that were not Italian. So I don't even speak Italian very well, but I'm, I'm super happy that we made it. So it's, used, it's not teaching astronomy, but it's using astronomy to, um, to produce something on, on, on the students of the school. So for example, we use astronomy for an astronomy and and art to, to teach about the nebulas, but also the artistic part of the, of the analysis and also astronomy and religion to think about it. For example, also there is another activity of astronomy and a, a meeting with very old people. So we were, uh, they will analyze some Kepler data <laughs> and, and we will talk about planets, for example, that now we are discovering planets, but people in the past, they never thought that we would discover planets and the life uh, like, uh, like that is not in, in the earth, but in other planets. And, 
and discussion about many other things. So more like a philosophical way to, to approach the life using astronomy. So this is more or less idea, not just giving knowledge, but giving experiences. So it was nice the fact that we got this money from the government and we are doing this project for one year. And I really, really like it, but also I really, really like research. So for now, I'm still sure that I want to be a postdoc, but I'm still doing some things about science communication. It certainly is important to have the research background to give yourself the credibility to talk about when in the outreach. Mm -hmm. Okay, a couple of people are asking about the age group. Again, repeat the ages of the students that you're going to be working with. Yeah, so it's uh, around 14, 13, 14 years old. So it will change a bit. It depends on the schools a bit because we, we still need to fix some details. But more or less, this is the age that we are talking about. For example, I remember that I gave a, a talk online for the for my little sister of seven years old. And I managed to, to take the attention of these very small children. And, and then I received a lot of comments from the parents that after the talk in the lunch, they were, they were talking about astronomy, about the universe, about the fact that we are a dust of stars that they died in the past. So it's, it's like impressive the fact that they they really like it. I think astronomy is a very interesting science and, and it's, it's not easy, but I think it's, it's possible to make it uh, very interesting for everyone, depending on the age. I, I, so a couple of other um, questions. Um, one, uh, Helen asks, can you speak a little bit about your experience as a woman or woman of color in science, mm -hmm. beginning as the only female student in your high school physics class? Do you see female students or people of color not staying in the field because of poor experiences? Yeah, this is a very difficult topic. And, and for me, it's one of the most important topics. Actually, this um, project that we have, it has a lot of, of this. For example, the amount of students that I asked for to, to do the, um, the, the laboratories, the 70% are a woman. So uh, I just try to change that because I really see that from the very beginning, from the high school and in the university where we were just a few. I was the only student in, uh, that finished the bachelor in, the, in Catolica, in my, my generation. So this is not nice also because I had really bad experiences during, the, during my career so far. And, and this should change. I'm, I'm trying to uh, to th I mean, I, I'm trying to change it somehow, but I, I think that it's a, it's a very long process. Uh, one of the things that I'm doing is trying to motivate young people and to show them that it's possible because they see you as a woman and they say like, oh, you are a genius. But no, like we are not genius. We just stayed here because we really like it. But of course, we have to also mention that we face many problems and, and it's part of it for now. It's not okay, but it's part of it. So I think it's good to talk about it because then people know that it's normal and they stay, uh, keep trying, let's say. But I really see a lot of, uh, a lot of friends of mine that are doing astronomy, they left the academia for that. Um, and this is pretty sad because it's a topic that shouldn't be like this, but uh, at least I think that it's getting better with time, but I, I really had really bad experiences. And with, uh, for example, also racist people because I'm South American. So I'm a South American and I'm a woman. So everything is wrong with me. Like <laughs> I, it cannot be worse probably. And I really see that uh, that is a problem. It's a problem to be South American because a priori people don't don't believe in your things. And and there are some some workshop that I attended, and and it's crazy the fact that if you're a woman or South, South American or something like this, the first five minutes of your talk in a conference, you have to convince the people that you are good enough to get their their attention. And this is not okay. I mean. I'm, I'm, I do it and I try, but, uh, but also it's, it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's tough, it's difficult. Um, I think the best way to, to change it is to 
reach um, a level to, to be like an example for other people and a motivation and be actively talking with people around. For example, I have a, an Instagram account for just for astronomy. So the name is Shot Astronomico and I share science in, in Spanish, Italian and English. And many girls uh, text me to, to know about how it is to be an astronomer, a girl. And I always take the time to answer all of the questions that they have. So I think it is a very hard work, but I think that it's changing also. So this is really nice. I'm reminded of the story that uh, <clears throat> Rosalie Lopez at JPL tells. Um, when she was a young girl in Brazil, she saw a uh, press release, and this was the 1960s, from JPL with some, uh, you know, busty secretary that was just sort of put on there as an eye candy bit. But for her, it was enough to see that women were working at JPL. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, uh, and this inspired her to, you know, to stick with it. Of course, you know, she wound up being editor of Icarus. So. Yeah, they, I think the interesting thing is that in the in all our stories we have an inspiration, and and that's why I think it's important it's important to to be one of them in the future. I'm still a PhD student, but I hope in the future I would be someone that can motivate Chilean girls to to try and to try harder and and to I don't know to 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 follow the the dreams because people just give up and I really understand when they give up in that sense because sometimes it's a bit difficult. That's a wrap for this podcast. Our audio editors were Brother Guy Consolmagno and myself, Bob Tremblay. You can listen to our other podcasts and read our posts on the web at vaticanobservatory.org. If you'd like to attend our full moon meetups live, join our Sacred Space Astronomy community also at vaticanobservatory.org. Clear skies, everyone.